Good morning, Daybreakers. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, just to clarify, our pastor, Jesse, has been unusually quiet this morning. He uh, woke up, uh, supposed to be leading us in worship this morning, but woke up without his voice. So uh, he's not angry. Uh, and uh, just, wanted, just wanted to clarify. So if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to continue in our sermon series in the book of 1 John. If you want to find your way there in your Bibles or on your devices, we're in chapter 3. We're going to be finishing up the third chapter this morning. So if you have your Bibles, find your way to chapter 3, 1 John, chapter 3, verses 18 through 24. As if you're able, out of reverence for God's word, would you please stand? We're going to read those verses together and pray together. But this is God's word, 1 John 3, verses 18 through 24. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Word we just taught our kids about. It goes on to say, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of the son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit who he has given us. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you speak to us by your word through your Spirit. And so, Father, we gather here this morning to experience you, and that's my prayer for myself, for each of us, that we would, by your Spirit, experience you this morning. I think it's safe to say we all have come here this morning at different places, emotionally, spiritually, even physically, but um, our greatest need and desire is to experience you, to hear from you. We live not on bread alone, on food alone, but by your word. And so we give you our time, we give you our attention, we give you our focus, and we say to you, Lord, speak, Lord, we're listening. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. So you can be seated. So in the spirit of our political season, I thought I would begin with a quote from a politician, uh, an old one. Uh, and uh, see how political savvy you guys are. Uh, but this is one of our founders, I'll give you a clue, who wrote this in a letter after the Constitution had been written. It's, he, he said, our new Constitution is now established, and it has uh, an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Anybody want to take a stab at a guess? Jefferson. Not Jefferson, not Adams. I heard it. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. Good job, Dennis. All right. Well, I, I mentioned that quote because there is something that God wants us to be certain of, and it's one of the reasons, if not the primary reason, that John wrote this letter. He wanted us to be certain of our eternal life of our relationship with him. Actually, he closed his letter uh, by saying this, 1 John 5, 13, kind of summarizing uh, what the letter, but really summarizing everything that he wrote, maybe a summary, summarization of the whole Bible. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might hope, or you might, not you might hope, but that you may know, know, that you have eternal life. And so uh, I mentioned that primary purpose of John's letter because I, I want us to think a lot about that this, mor this morning, this idea that God wants us to have the assurance that we're in a right relationship with him and that we're going to heaven when we die. And John says that's one of the purposes uh, of this letter. And really, I would say, again, the whole purpose or maybe the primary purpose of scripture. So with that in mind, let's think about these verses that we have before us here this morning 
Uh, let's begin back again with verse 18. I'll just read it again. We've heard it now a couple times. But uh, he begins this portion of scripture by saying, little children, uh, another term of endearment. He uses this a lot throughout his letter. Uh, probably older guy now. The best we can tell, John's probably in his 80s when he wrote this. He's the last living apostle. And he uses that term to uh, probably talk to people who are following in his footsteps, if you will. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth, but in action and in truth. And I would say if there's a verse that sort of captures the sermon series title that uh, Jesse's put forth for this letter, True Love, this kind of gets to the point here. You know, let's just not, you know, walk, talk the talk, if you will, but let's walk the walk. I mean, I'm sure all of us, our parents, our grandparents, that uh, one time or another as we grow, were growing up, what did they say? They said, talk is cheap. And uh, John says it uh, maybe in a, in a better way there. But what he's saying is, uh, if, if you say you're a believer, uh, then your life should be characterized by love. The goal of your life should be to be loving others and, and to love God. A couple of weeks ago, or maybe several weeks ago now when I was speaking, you know, I, I mentioned that if you look at the letter of 1 John, I think it contains what I call spiritual vital signs. When you go to the doctor, they check your blood pressure, pulse, and respiration. If, if you read the letter of 1 John, almost the majority of the verses, if you got out three highlighters, you could, you could label uh, three different colors. Either it's about obeying God, it's about loving others or loving God, or it's about belief. You know, it's the spiritual vital signs of a Christian. What are the spiritual vital signs? Belief in Christ, and then a life where the goal is to obey God, and a life where the goal is uh, to love other people. And so uh, John says here, you know, if we say, he says that, in several times in this letter, if we say that we have eternal life, uh, then our life should be, our life goal should be to love other people and, and to love God. And uh, uh, we should have a, a sense of assurance that comes out of that. He goes on, verses 19 and 20, to elaborate on this. And he says, by this, we shall know that we are of the truth and we have eternal life and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Uh, a very significant phrase there, uh, whenever our heart condemns us. And I think if you're a believer, you at some point uh, kind of can relate to this idea of having a, a condemning heart and interestingly, John is saying here, you don't want to always trust your heart. You know, the, the mantra of our day is what? Follow your heart. That, that's maybe the worst advice ever that you can do, uh, or you could follow. Actually, the Bible says polar opposite to that. What does the Bible say about the heart? The heart is de deceitful. Who, who can know it? And actually, the book of Romans argues that our heart is prone to a couple of different things. Our heart, in Romans 2.15, is prone to the conscience using it to make excuses, meaning when we do something that we shouldn't be doing, we, we can make an excuse for it. But also, the heart can be used to not only excuse, but accuse and falsely accuse us. Uh, for example, when we've asked for forgiveness of our sin, and uh, we still feel uh, or experience a, a, a sense of condemnation. You know, it, it's very important as a Christian to be able to discern, well, what, what is conviction, which does come from the Spirit of God, and, and what is condemnation? You know, to, again, repeat the example, we know that co condemnation comes from the enemy of our soul. Actually, the Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren, and so one of the primary ways that Satan tries to work in your life is to remind you of a sin that you've confessed or uh, help you think of yourself as a worthless person or a hopeless person. And so uh, there's a, a sense of condemnation that comes from the accuser of our soul. You know, when we were convicted of a sin 
It's a hopeful situation, and the goal is repentance and faith and restoration. When we're condemned for our sin, we're, we're hopeless. Uh, when we're convicted of a sin, it's very specific, and, and, uh, and it has a goal, again, uh, that's hopeful. When it's condemnation, it's very vague, and it leaves you feeling worthless or despairing. You know, conviction, again, always leads to freedom, but condemnation leads to bondage. And so I, I, I think what John is trying to say here, and interestingly, I think the best translation is for whenever our heart condemns us, as, as believers, we're going to have uh, those times where we have to discern between uh, conviction and condemnation in our heart when it comes to thinking about ourselves. And I, I've, I've, as I've talked to people who were leading the small groups that we have this past week, uh, now I've had several people say the same thing to me. It seems like John talks very black and white. Like, if you love God, you're going to obey him. Uh, if you're really a Christian, your life is going to be about loving other people. I mean, he just says it again, uh, very black and white here. And so I, I think one of the reasons he sort of slips this parenthetical thought in is because he realizes that when a person evaluates their life, I, I don't know how it works for you, but I would imagine it works the same way it does for me and you. Uh, and when you evaluate how well you're doing at loving other people, and when you evaluate your life at how well you're doing at obeying God, I've never come to a place in my life where I say I'm loving enough. I, I, I've never come to a place in my life uh, where I said I'm obeying enough, I think I can say with all honesty and then set my heart assured that to say the goal of my life is to obey God. And, and the goal of my life is to love God and, and loving other people's. But you can't love enough and, and you can't obey enough. But Jesus is enough. And that's what he's trying to say here. God Jesus is greater than your hearts whenever your hearts condemn you. God is greater than your heart, and he knows everything. He knows the worst thing that you've ever done. He knows the third worst thing that you've ever done. He knows the worst thing that you, done, you, you did this past week. He knows the worst thought that you had this very day. And his grace is enough. And his son Jesus is enough. And so whenever our hearts condemn us, we set our hearts into assurance by believing that God is enough. He's bigger than our hearts, and, and Jesus is enough. You know, my pastor, my first pastor, used to call that, that introspection, that condemnation. He called it, you know, reverse pride is what he, called it, he would call it, which is kind of a thought-provoking term. But he, he said, you know, really when you get into this idea of, I, 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 about being loving enough and about being obedient enough and good enough. It, it's sort of a, a reverse pride. I mean, ultimately, you're focusing on yourself and not focusing on Christ and what he's done for you. And I think that's what uh, John's trying to do, get us to sort of get our mind off of that and get our focus back on Christ and what he's done for that, done for us, I should say. Uh, when I was... Uh, working uh, on my theology degree, I worked part-time in a nursing home as a nurse, my other uh, job in life hat that I wear. And there was a, a patient that I became pretty close to. Her name was Merle Adams. She was 99 years old. She actually uh, turned 100 uh, right before I moved to Vermont. And uh, she still had all of her uh, senses about her. I mean, she was uh, frail because of her age. She didn't get out of bed much. But uh, I worked evenings, and every evening before I would uh, go home to leave my shift, I would always go in, and she was a night person, so she was always awake, and uh, we would pray together, and uh, sometimes she'd even put her, you know, her hand on my hand or her he hand on my head, and she would, she would pray for me, and one of the um, phrases that she would use when she would pray uh, was Satan get in front of me. She'd used that phrase a few times in some of the prayers that she said. And I finally had the courage to say something to her and ask her about this. I'm like, you know, the, 
why would you even say that? The Bible says that Jesus, one time, when one of the disciples said something stupid, uh, Jesus said to them, Satan, get behind me. And she goes, yeah, I, I, I know that's what it says. She goes, but I like him where I can see him. And I was like, I don't even know how to argue with that. I mean, how do you argue with a 99-year-old woman that probably had more Bible memorized than I even have now as a 50-something-year-old man? Uh, but uh, I, I think she was a little bit on to something. And what I mean by that is uh, sometimes when the accuser of our soul condemns us and says, you know, how can you call yourself a Christian? How can you re really be a believer? How, you, know, you know, how can you have any hope? And sometimes you, what you got to do is you maybe need to take Marlee's advice and uh, put the enemy of your soul in front of you. And then I have a, something you can tell him. Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8, verse 34. This is a, a good verse to quote during those moments. Who is to condemn? Who is con to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, interceding for me. Who is to condemn? You know, Jesus said, I didn't come into this world to condemn the world. Why did he come to the world? To save the world. And so, you know, I think... Uh, John's uh, here giving us this idea of uh, there's something that we need to do whenever our hearts condemn us. Uh, we need to uh, actually, uh, you know, speak back, talk back, if you will, to the enemy of our soul. And so what happens when we do that? Verse 21, if we go on to do that and we come out of condemnation. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, what happens? We have confidence before God. We have confidence before God. You know, to, to live with a assured heart is essential to live the Christian life. You know, we're not to live with condemned hearts. We're to see ourselves with hit, to be hidden with God in Christ Jesus. And we're, we're to have assured uh, um an assured life. I mean, if nothing else, it definitely makes your Christianity more enjoyable, but it also makes you more effective to know that you're in a right standing with God and his righteousness is your righteousness. I mean, if you're living in a sense of fear or doubt when you're approached from God, I think the argument that can be made from this verse is you're not going to approach God. You're not going to live out the ideal life that, that God wants you to live. There's a a quote that I put together, a quote from a author, Jerry Bridges, but really a, a hodgepodge quote um, from a bunch of different Puritans. Uh, but this is what he says about this idea of when you live in an uncertain relationship with God. It says, the great difficulty with many Christians is that, that they cannot persuade themselves that Christ uh, or God loves them. And the reason why they cannot feel confident of the love of God is they know they do not deserve his love. How can an infinitely pure God love those who are defiled with sin, proud, selfish, discontented, ungrateful, disobedient? That indeed is hard to believe, but we must. And then a, a great uh, quote here actually from uh, John Owen, the greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the father the great, greatest unkindness you can do to him is not to believe that he loves you. And uh, John here is saying, I think, that we need to live in that sense of being assured of God and his love for us. And going again back to Romans 8, what can separate us from the love of God that we have that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Nothing. Nothing can separate us uh, from that love. You know, many years ago, I heard a, a illustration, and I don't remember the setting of the point that the person was trying to make. Uh, he was trying to illustrate a biblical point, but it's an illustration that stuck with me that I think is somewhat fitting for thinking about being confident before God. But it, it tells the story of a, a, a man who was traveling across the United States before 
we had means of modern transportation, maybe, for example, going from Vermont to New York, if you will, and uh, came across a great lake, maybe something like Lake Champlain, and he knew from the map there was no way to get from Vermont to New York without crossing the lake or going around the lake, which obviously would have added you know, days, if not weeks, to the transportation if he had to uh, walk it. And so in the interest of time, he decides he's going to cross the lake, but it, it was winter time, and it hadn't been a, an especially cold winter, so he wasn't too confident about the thickness of the ice. And so uh, he tested it, the ice seemed okay, but just to be safe, he basically laid out on all fours uh, to spread out his weight, disperse his weight, just so he hopefully wouldn't break through the ice, and slowly and anxiously and uh, uh, strenuously made his way across the lake, uh, and it took him you know, a great deal of time to make his way all the way across. As he's about to get off the lake, step on dry land, he hears a rumbling in his ear. And about that time, he looks back, and here comes another gentleman. But this gentleman is driving a stagecoach and has four horses and a big smile on his face. And he waves at the man as he hits the dry land and he takes off. Obviously, one person enjoyed the journey a lot more than the other person. And I, I think what John is alluding to, you know, we're, we're to live a life where we're confident in God and his love for us and what Christ has done for us. And so whenever we have that sense of confidence, uh, we draw near to him. Uh, listen to the way the writer of Hebrews said it. Hebrews 4.16, same word that we find in uh, First John, but he says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. Grace is not getting what you deserve. Uh, great, I mean, uh, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And so we, we approach God with that mindset. And then also in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, verse 19 and 22 it says this, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, meaning into the presence of God, then what are we to do? We're to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies uh, made pure, made, our bodies washed with pure water and uh that's the description that John seems to be giving here of the way that we live our Christian lives. We live them confidently because of Christ and what he's done for us. And, and then what happens when we do that? Back into uh, the verses here, verse 22, 1 John 22 says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. Quite a promise, huh? We enter into his presence with confidence. We live out our Christian life with confidence. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. You know, at first glance uh, of that verse, it's almost like we've you know, won the spiritual lottery here, you know, a ask anything. But, you know, I think John's probably quoting Jesus is, uh, Jesus here, what Jesus said something very similar. He goes, whatever you ask in my name, it will be given to you. And so uh, I don't think this is like prosperity gospel, uh, name it, claim it. Uh, but there is a sense that I think John's alluding to, that Jesus alluded to, is there is a sense of living a life and having this sort of prayer life where our prayers are God's will and our purposes are God's purposes, and they line up to that. I mean, obviously, prayer is a little more nuanced than you just ask it and you get it. Um, listen to the, the you know same writer just a couple of chapter, chapters later. This is what John says. Uh, 
This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything what? According to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what he asked of him. And so, you know, uh, there's this sense of John is saying that we as Christians should live a confident life, confident in our, our, our life with him, confident in our prayers to him. And then let me just uh, another quote here. This one's from Charles Spurgeon, who I think sort of puts all the pieces together here. Uh, when he thinking about answered prayers, but he says, notice the link between confidence as to our rightness and power in prayer. When a child has done wrong and knows it, he cannot run to his father and ask for favors as he used to do. He feels timid in his father's presence because of the sense of his guilt. But if you and I know we have endeavored with all our heart to love the Lord and our fellow man and to act righteously in all things, we have a saved confidence which enables us to speak with God as a man speaketh with his friend. And this kind of confidence God greatly loves, and he listens to those who possess it. Such people may ask what they will of God. They have learned to bring their minds into the conformity with the will of God's, so that the desire of their heart shall be granted to them. I think that's a great summary of this idea of confidently praying and confidently coming into God's presence. You know, Psalmist said it a little differently, but basically said the same thing, and you probably know this first. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will what? Give you the desires of your heart. You know, there there is this sense of uh, uh, God wanting your life to line up with his will and his purposes. And when you're praying, you're praying his will back to him and uh, you are lining yourself up uh, with his will and his way and you're bringing the kingdom of, uh, of heaven into this world. So delight in yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He goes on, verse 23 this is what he says. He says, and this is his commandment that we believe in the name of the, his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. A couple of uh, interesting grammatical points there. Uh, and this is his commandment, singular, not plural, singular. And uh, he goes on to say that we believe actually a little more grammar here. Uh, it's a Greek verb and a tense called the aorist tense, meaning once and for all. So we do one commandment and we do it once and for all. What is that commandment? That we believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ. And then what's going to happen? We love one another just as he commanded us. You know, again, one commandment. And then it's a once and for all belief. I, I'll never forget when I uh, read the book of John uh, probably 15 years ago in anticipation of trying to preach through the book of John, the gospel of John, John's biography of Jesus. Um, very vividly, I remember getting about halfway through the gospel of John, and as, you, uh, as we've talked about, you know, John was Jesus's, one of Jesus's best friend. He was in the inner circle, if you will. And, you know, if you pay attention to any of the Gospels, you should pay attention to all of them. But you would think that John would have some more of the intimate knowledge than some of the other Gospels because he was there walking with him. And he even says at the end of his book, the Gospel of John, he goes, I wish I could tell you all the things he do, did, but I just don't have enough time. I don't have enough paper. So I had to, you know, be succinct about the things that I wanted you to know. But all that to say about halfway through his biography of Jesus, he said, he quoted Jesus saying, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And I was like, well, that's weird. I don't remember in the previous chapters any commandments coming from Jesus. And so I continued to read, and then I came to one commandment. And you know what that commandment was? Very implicitly, or I should say very explicitly, it was the commandment where Jesus said, you have one work to do, 
and that's to believe on the one who has sent me. And actually, if you look at that word believe, it's used about a hundred times. So about a hundred times in John's gospel, uh, the only commandment in the John's gospel is to believe. No other commandments are listed. I mean, he could have picked out anything, any sayings uh, of Jesus. Uh, he does say one other time, uh, uh, argument could be for one other commandment, and that's Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. So what, what, what's the only commandment we have to obey? To believe in Jesus, to put our trust in. In Jesus, and that's how we uh, set our, our hearts assured before Him, because you know we believe in it. How, how much uh, how much belief does it take? Uh, uh, just believing. It just says you know I you know when you sit in a chair, uh, you know you're all sitting in a chair. You know there was a moment where your weight shifted and you fully rested upon that chair, and that's the same aspect in a spiritual uh, uh, way that we fully have to rest our life and our give our sins to Jesus. We, we rest in that and we believe upon him. And that's the commandment uh, that we're to follow. And then the last verse in this section, he says in uh, verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. And so this mystical experience that someone who's a truly a believer has of God himself by his spirit coming and taking up residence in our hearts. How do we, how do we know that we're a believer? Well, John says we know we're a believer because God has, by his spirit, come and taken up residence in our lives. The book of Romans says uh, we call him Father, Daddy, Abba, Father. But uh, his spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God because the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in our hearts. The Bible says in the, the book of 2 Corinthians that, that the Holy Spirit is our, our down payment, uh, to, to let us know that we're really in a relationship with him and that we're going to, to heaven and when we die. It says, um, first Corin I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 122, he's put his seal of ownership on us. He's put his spirits in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 5, he says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given his spirit as a down payment, guaranteeing what is to come. And then Ephesians 1.14 says it uh, in a little bit different way. His spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And again, Romans 8, I alluded to verses 15 and 16 says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit that we have brought you for, to adoption to sonship. And by it, by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit, spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. How, how do we assure our hearts? We assure our hearts by the spirit that he has given us. And so I wanted to close with a, a, a quick video. Um, one of the fascinating experiences that I've had uh, as a nurse, and it hasn't happened many times, maybe a handful of times, uh, has been when I was taking care of a patient or a resident that uh, either had Alzheimer's or severe, severe dementia and had a, a moment of what I would call sort of a reawakening. One of the most profound times that happened, I was caring for a patient uh, in a hospital setting, and he had been there for months, and a um, uh, much older gentleman, 
and just obviously had a, a pretty severe dementia, didn't remember much, didn't talk a lot, um, didn't remember uh, his wife had passed away, so would still talk about her as if she was still alive, didn't remember some of the children whenever they would come to visit. But something fascinating happened one day. There was another patient that got put in the same room as he was, and um, uh, I was new to Vermont, so this was back in probably 2000, 2001, and I was talking and engaged with this other person about fishing because uh, I'd never been fly fishing before. So he was explaining to me that he was a fly fisherman, so I was trying to get from him some of the details about where he went, how, how to fly fish, and so forth. And this other person, the, the older gentleman, his name was Ted, it was like he woke up. And all of a sudden, he literally uh, had like a three to five minute conversation about fly fishing with this guy. And he, he was talking about where to go fly fishing in Vermont. He was talking about the lures that he would use. He was talking about a fish that he had caught and um, didn't last long. But then he sort of went back into his uh, normal state. But I was fascinated that here was a guy I'd known for months who couldn't remember some you know, significant details about his loved ones, but he, he could remember where to go fly fishing and what type of lure to use. And it was, uh, it was just a, a fascinate, fascinating experience. And so I, I mentioned that because I wanted to play a, a video of a woman whose mother also has some severe dementia and just her interaction with her I think probably, or at least I, I think, captures the essence of at least of what I've been trying to say, and I think of what John says in these verses. So why don't we play this video, and then I'll, I'll close this with prayer. Hey, can you tell me what your address is? What my address is? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Okay. Um, what color shirt did you have on yesterday? I don't know. Uh, what'd you have for lunch today? Food. <laughs> Good food. All right. So who is who is Linda? Do you know Linda? Um. What about? Paul. Paul? Paul. Paul. All right. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the one who saved me and lives in my heart and will take me home. <laughs> Quite amazing. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> Quite amazing. Let's pray. The band will come up here. 